Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aura Go. I work at the Mental Health Foundation Australia, and I am your host for today's webinar. I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people as the traditional owners of the land on which I work, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. On behalf of the Mental Health Foundation Australia and the CEO, Mr. Vasan Srinivasan, I would like to welcome and thank each one of you for attending today's Be Well educational webinar. This week is World Suicide Prevention Awareness Week. And on this special occasion, Associate Professor Judy Hope is presenting this webinar on challenges and innovations, suicide prevention in emergency departments. I would now like to introduce our presenter, Associate Professor Judy Hope, who is a consultant psychiatrist in Melbourne with extensive clinical and academic experience. She currently holds the Academic Chair for Psychiatry at Eastern Health and is the Deputy Director of the Centre for Education and Research at Delmont Hospital. Professor Hope has taught psychiatry, medicine and surgery across two universities and has lectured extensively in psychopharmacology. Her research interests include outcome measurement, health services research, suicide prevention, and person-centered pharmacological care. Professor Hope is also the psychiatrist for the Box Hill Emergency Department and runs her own private practice. Please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Judy Hope. Thanks, Judy. <laughs> thank you so much, Aura, and thank you for the kind introduction. Can you hear me okay today? Great. Okay, so firstly, I must say how grateful I am for the opportunity to share some of our work from Eastern Health with you today. As you've heard, I'm a clinical academic, which means that I have a dual position working uh, as both a uh, working clinician within a health service and a researcher within Monash University. And clinical academics are in a wonderful position since we bring clinical acumen into research and also research into clinical spaces. Before I begin today, I also would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet today. For me, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today or any other First Nations people. We also um, at Eastern Health strongly recognise and value the knowledge and wisdom of people with a lived experience of mental ill health, their families, supporters and the practitioners who work with them. We celebrate their strengths and resilience in facing the challenges associated with their recovery and value their important role in the development, delivery, and evaluation of health and community services. And today, I declare no relevant conflicts of interest. Also, before we begin today, I would like to note the Eastern Health adaptation of the EveryMind National Communications Charter, which is reproduced here, which indicates the language to which we aspire and some of the reasons why. Eastern Health is proud to have been one of the first uh, mental health signatories to the National Communications Charter. I would also note the importance of the mental health of every one of us here today. For us as frontline workers, we are well aware of the need to actively monitor and address our mental health, and I would encourage you to do the same during this talk. Some of the content here may be confronting, so it's important that each and every one of us take care of ourselves. And if you find the content that I'm presenting today difficult or, um, or, or, over, uh, or, or over arousing, then I would encourage you to practice your self-care, maybe even switch me off for a little while, but do take care of yourselves. Because today I will be talking about suicide. Suicide is a major public health issue in Australia, as it is around the world. In Australia, the lifetime, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, the rates of, of suicide in Australia are 12.1 per 100,000 people. That is that in Australia each year, over 3,000 people are lost to suicide. In Victoria, the rate is 10.1 per 100,000 people. 
And that rate is a little lower because of the contribution to the death rate of people in Northern Territory, Western Australia and Northern Queensland, particularly the burden posed by regional and remote, remote communities and the burden experienced by our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communi communities in relation to uh, death by suicide. I come from Eastern Health, which sits in the eastern part of Melbourne, and we're a large uh, health service that covers over 3,000 square kilometres and provides care to over 850,000 people. And in our region, as elsewhere in Australia, the phenomena of death by suicide is very real. In our local government areas, in Whitehorse, it's 7.5 per 100,000. In Maroondah, 11.4. In Yarra Ranges, 11.1. So that over each five-year period, a significant number of people die by suicide, which affects very, very significantly the people around the person and the communities which we serve at Eastern Health. The ABS data shows us that suicide is one of the leading causes of death of people aged 15 to 44. And we know that suicide is a gendered issue. On the left here, you see the age specific suicide rates published by the ABS. Along the bottom, the rates in females versus the rates in males, uh, according to different age groups. And you can see from this graph what a preponderance of deaths are attributable to men. When you look at raw numbers, indeed men outnumber women to suicide deaths uh, three to one, which means that three quarters of deaths are in men. And you can see that it's a particular problem of middle-aged men and older men. To the right, similarly an ABS graph, looking across the years at deaths per 100,000 in the population, again showing the, uh, the excess in men. Looking now at ABS data for suicide attempts, the ABS data is unable to separate out uh, suicide attempts from non-suicidal self-injury. But nonetheless, you can see that there is a very significantly inverted gender risk. And in fact, women on the right of this graph are much more likely to present with suicide attempts than men. And it is particularly the province of younger women. This graph looks much skinnier than the other graphs, but it's actually an artefact because along the bottom here, you'll see that the, the scale is different. So in fact, suicide attempts outnumber suicides very substantially, of course. And we know that the lifetime risk of, of suicide attempts in our population is one in 33. And we also know that across people's lifetime, one in eight people will contemplate suicide. We know that there are important factors associated with risks in our communities. And the Victorian Government's Suicide Prevention Response Strategy Discussion Paper recently released divides these into individual, relational, community and society factors. We know that there are some groups who have very significantly higher risk. Those who have a previous attempt and will get to some of the data around previous attempt a little bit later on. We know that other communities in our groups, such as culturally and lingu linguistically diverse communities, LGBTQI plus communities, and our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities are disproportionately affected. We also know that our veterans, our men generally, and our rural men specifically are affected and there are particular occupations who are more at risk. We also know that those people who have a family history of suicide or are bereaved by suicide are also at greater risk. We know that mental health disorders also carry an increased risk, and this is important to us in our work in emergency departments. For people with no mental health disorder, the lifetime risk sits at about 0.3%. But for people with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, borderline personality disorder, substance use disorders and anxiety, the risk is significantly elevated. 
We also know that some of those risks are multiplicative. For instance, if you're a man who uses substantial alcohol and has depression, then your risk is elevated to 16.7%. So that we know that the identification and treatment of mental disorders and illnesses is important in our work. However, not all suicide is related to mental health disorders, that many people don't have an illness per se. And we draw here on the important idea of psych ache when the ability to manage is overwhelmed by things such as grief, shame, loneliness, relationship breakdowns or other psychosocial stress and can be complicated by the presence of substance use disorder and depleted social systems. And we know that there are some people who carry chronic vulnerability to suicidal thinking and risk, particularly those who've been exposed to adverse childhood events. Adverse childhood events are sometimes known as the ACEs, and there is a 10-point scale outlining the ACEs. And for those people who have more than four out of 10 of, of items such as neglect, emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, exposure to family violence, or substance use or incarceration in parents, we know that those people have very substantially elevated risks of lifestyle disorders, of physical health disorders, increased risk of suicide attempt, increased risk of death by suicide, risk of incarceration and perpetration of violence. And we know that there are also significant wider factors in relation to the development of suicidal risk, societal factors such as unemployment, recession and disadvantage. And this was described by Durkheim well over 100 years ago, the importance of societies on population risks. We know that there are important social factors such as stigma and racism and cultural factors including lifestyle, values, religion and belief. And more importantly, the effect of things like media factors has been recognised. And many of these, uh, so this wider social contact and social factors have been reflected in the lifespan model of suicide prevention produced by the Black Dog Institute in New South Wales, which acts as a really useful framework for our own local suicide prevention work. And I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with the work of Black Dog, including of, of in the lifespan model. But those who are not, I would encourage you to look at the lifespan, which is um, uh, shows comprehensively uh, a plan to combat suicide in our communities. On a local level, Eastern Health have made a substantial financial and operational commitment to reducing suicide in our local community. This strategy and work was based on the Victorian government's targets to reduce suicide and have been inspired significantly by the Gold Coast's zero suicide model and program. Our work and our strategy was locally um, uh, uh, based on some of our previous work, particularly in the collaborative recovery model. The collaborative recovery model was developed at the University of Wollongong and subsequently developed by Nimai National and was locally adapted by our co-design team and co-implemented to our whole of service workforce. And we've recently produced a paper, which is under consideration, examining the effects of a whole of service workforce transformation uh, in, de in delivering recovery-based services. And we aim to transform the language, attitudes and skills of our whole workforce. And CRM uh, is in, in, an important part of our work in suicide prevention and has informed our suicide prevention strategy. The strategy itself is based on five pillars, which are shown here. Connect and converse, which is about being engaged with our community. Lead and aspire, because we can't do anything without, the, with, without our leadership being on board. To understand and educate, to make sure that our workforce have excellent uh, evidence-based care to deliver. Our care and transition to make sure that people receive excellent care and excellent linkages with services. And to improve and innovate, to use data and to continue to develop our services. 
And this strategy has been mapped back to a number of frameworks to ensure internal and external consistency of the strategy, including to the lifespan model, which is shown here. So here's the lifespan model. And here are some of the important parts of lifespan. And within the emergency department context, the important ones are using evidence-based treatment for suicidality, improving emergency and follow-up care for suicidal crisis, improving safety and reducing access to means, and improving the competency and confidence of frontline workers. Because we know that emergency departments are really important places for suicide prevention. And some of our understanding of this comes from quite old data. Firstly, if you look at coroner's data, that is death from suicide of people who appear in the coroner's court, there are a number of studies that have looked backward at, uh, at whether those people have had contact with their emergency departments. And this study from 2003 shows that almost 40% of people in this particular study had been in contact with our emergency departments in the previous 12 months. And 15% had attended for self-harm, that is deliberate self-harm or suicidal IDA uh, or a suicide attempt. In 2009, it was demonstrated that 43% had attended to, uh, the emergency department in the, last, in the previous 12 months, with over 25% of those having presented on three or more occasions. And this study noted the increased risk in those who used alcohol. We also know from this 2008 study that even people presenting with suicidal ideation had an increased risk, as well as those presenting with non-suicidal self-injury also demonstrated an increased risk of subsequent completed suicide. We can also examine the data looking at it from the other way around, that is, of people who attend our emergency departments, what will happen across time. And there was an important study in 1988 from Horton and Fagg who showed that for people who present with a suicide attempt to an emergency department, that across the following 12 months, that 1% of people would lose their lives to suicide. In 2002, there was a review paper that showed that again, of people who present to our EDs with a suicide attempt, 15% will re-attempt in the subsequent 12 months and between a half and two percent would die by suicide. In 2016, there was a large 15-year Danish longitudinal register studies published, and this study showed similar results. In the following 12 months, almost 12 percent of people would re-attempt, and nearly one percent would die by suicide. Alarmingly, this study also showed that within the first week that 3.6% of people would re-attempt and one in a thousand people would die by suicide. And a further study from 2015 shows again that repeated attempts, uh, repeated visits rather, are more likely to see uh, death by suicide as an outcome. Ignore the, the, the flow chart on the left. I draw your attention to the graph on the right, which is from this large 2016 Danish study. And what you can see here is the years of follow-up that extend out to 15 years and repeat suicide attempt data. And you can see here that women outnumber men for repeat suicide attempts. You can also see that most of the action is here. The curves are steepest in the first six months where repeats are most common. However, the, the risk continues to be present across an extended period of time. These graphs show deaths by suicide subsequent to an index suicide attempt. This is the Horton and Fag 1988 study that shows that the percentage of deaths by suicide is greatest in men than women. It also shows this steep curve at the beginning, showing that the action again is in this first six months, but again, the risk continues over the subsequent nine years. 
The second graph comes from the again from the Danish 2016 study, years of follow-up 15, and percentage of deaths by suicide. And in this study, you can see again that the action is here in the first six months, but again, the risk does not stop over 15 years. This graph also shows that the greatest risk of completed suicide is actually in older people compared to younger people. So as your age goes up at the index suicide attempt, so does your risk of eventual death by suicide, which are very sobering and disturbing figures. What does this all mean for our emergency departments on the ground? We know that emergency departments are important places for suicide prevention work and that we have the opportunity to be living labs. And I would like to say that our living lab looks as fabulous as this stock photo with these calm, organised clinicians in their, um, in their fabulous scrubs. But in fact, what it really looks like on the ground is become kind of something more like this. And this is our team uh, on a single day from the Box Hill Emergency Department. And you'll see my mental health clinician and registrar here with me in the ED. So we have three emergency departments inside Eastern Health, and each one has an embedded mental health triage team. In our three emergency departments at Eastern Health, we see many tens of thousands of people each year. And our mental health team see referrals from the general emergency departments. And we have over 7,000 mental health referrals each year between those three emergency departments. A recent audit of our figures showed that over half of people who, present, who are referred to us in, uh, uh, in mental health triage have, uh, have significant suicidal ideation and 18% of those referrals uh, have had a suicide attempt. So we deal with large numbers of people. Of people who present to us with suicidal crisis, there is significant heterogeneity in the underlying issues that sit underneath those presentations. We know that some people have severe mental illness, and historically this has been a group that we are more equipped to deal with and, and do so more successfully. People with severe mental illness where that is identified, understood, treated, and appropriate pathways of referral carved out, such as inpatient admissions, CAT team referrals, and so on. But we also see people with substantial drug and alcohol issues, psychosocial crises, and backgrounds of trauma with or without presentations of borderline personality disorder. And these people are much more likely to present repeatedly to our emergency departments. We see people who ha may have one, two, three, or even all four of these presentations comorbidly. And we see people across the lifespan from birth to death. So we see people referred to us as young as nine or 10 years of age, all the way through to the very elderly. And there are many challenges for us within the emergency department setting. Emergency departments are not designed for mental health issues. They're designed primarily for people with physical health issues. They're unwelcoming spaces. They're bright, they're noisy, they're, they're, they lack privacy. They have long wait times. Amongst our ED staff, who are primarily devoted to physical health disorders, there may be issues of stigma and low trauma literacy that affect the mental health care of people who come to us. We also see people who come to us with behaviours of concern, that is aggressive behaviours, and people who come frequently to the emergency department. And these issues can lead to distress and burnout in our emergency department staff. And we have significant numbers of people who present to us with mental health crises, who do not wait for the completion of assessment or care in emergency departments. And about 4% of people in our departments will leave before the end of care. And this is a figure which is consistent across emergency departments in Victoria, Australia and around the world. And so we've been involved in a number of uh, initiatives to address these issues. And very quickly, I'll just gloss over some of them that uh, we have been involved with at Eastern Health. 
Firstly, we were involved in the Teleprompt trial, which was a trial with Ambulance Victoria, looking at having mental health clinicians embedded with Ambulance Victoria in order to divert people away from the emergency department into more appropriate care. We've also had a number of innovations within our department, including telehealth assessments to reduce wait times. We've been very proud of a recent piece of work we did with Rotary and Box Hill, uh, producing lived experience co-designed navigation information for people attending our emergency departments, as well as the how to cope within our emergency departments information. And we very eagerly await lived experience workforce within our emergency departments in association with the findings of the Royal Commission in, into Mental Health in Victoria. We've recently run a very large program, which we're very proud of, which was a tripartite project between mental health, our emergency department colleagues, and the statewide borderline personality disorder body spectrum, which was a program in which we combined our clinical and research talents in producing a substantial training intervention for our emergency department colleagues. And this was a co-designed piece of work where we produced videos, podcasts and other information for our ED colleagues, upskilling them about borderline personality disorder and looking at changing attitudes and skills within our emergency department, which hopefully will change the experience of people with borderline personality disorder when they come to our um, to our departments. And this work has recently been um, uh, been picked up. Uh, for a small found, uh, Eastern Health Foundation grant to be expanded across our three emergency departments. In relation to behaviours of concern, we eagerly await the ability to input uh, um, programs such as safe wards, which have been successfully implemented into our inpatient units, and we would like to expand that into our emergency departments. And finally, for those people who did not wait, we've recently conducted a research project ringing people up and asking people what happened, why they came, why they left, and what happened next in order to improve the services that we deliver on the ground in emergency departments. To reiterate, there are many challenges in the emergency department. There is a high demand and that has become higher in recent times and this has been complicated by the advent of COVID and its effect on both workflow and workforce. COVID has led to substantial shortages of workforce in the community and nursing homes and NDIS and other services, which has led to backflows on our wards, increased numbers of people who, can't, who cannot be shifted from our inpatient wards and I mean our, our, our medical and surgical wards through back into the community. And that backflow onto our wards has led to a backflow in our emergency departments, where admitted patients are sometimes stranded in emergency departments for hours or even days. This leads to dangerous overcrowding in our emergency departments, and that's bad for patient care and safety and bad for our staff. And it's become very stressful. And you would have heard stories of ambulances ramping and people in, uh, in, in waiting rooms and corridors for extended periods of time. And this has been somewhat complicated by, uh, uh, by uh, uh, the implementation in Victoria of the Royal Commission into Mental Health Victoria uh, uh, findings. These findings are leading to massive expansion of services, extension of hours of delivery, and the rapid expansion of, of lived experience workforce and participation. And whilst the implementation of the Royal Commission findings carries many opportunities and, and improved ways of working, it's also been a burden of change at a time of very high demand. And in our emergency departments, we feel that very acutely. So our work in the emergency department is complicated by the issues of high risk, high numbers, workflow variability, heterogeneous presentations, overcrowded emergency departments and depleted workforces. One of the fallacies of working with suicide risk is the idea of suicide prediction. We don't do risk prediction. No one has a crystal ball and we know that there are no, there, there are no ways to do risk prediction. Instead, we do assessment 
and mitigation. An assessment is all about understanding the person who has arrived in crisis, their, their understanding of the meaning of their predicament, their individual context, their relationships, their families and support. And we talk to families and supporters in order to understand the context and also to understand the systems that people uh, live and reside within. And then we engage in mitigation of risk. And part of that mitigation is to uh, provide appropriate pathways of care. I have been a community psychiatrist, in fact, for many, many years, and, uh, and I used to work in, um, in one of our community teams at Box Hill. And three years ago, I came to work in the emergency department. And I went, we see so many people and we refer them so many places. Most people are not admitted into inpatient units despite presenting with suicidal crisis. We continue to send most people back into the community. And I thought to myself, where do we send people? What are the issues and what are the pathways of care that we use? And so I made myself a mind map. And this is the ugly map that I made. But it gives you, a the, the despite the busyness and ugliness of this map, it gives you a sense of the complexity of pathways of care out of the emergency department. So if the person is at the middle here with various sorts of issues, they might come into tertiary mental health services and many parts of that, such as admission, our assertive outreach teams or our, or our chronic care teams. People might go into back to primary care, into secondary care uh, um, options or into inpatient um, uh, private options. There's NDIS, there's specialist services, there's drug and alcohol services, their psychosocial services. There are telephone services and online services. You've got the idea of the, um, of the level of complexity. Luckily, in the last little while, there have been some really important developments for us on the ground. And some of those have been around assistance with entry and navigation, including important uh, uh, service delivery options from the primary health care network. Um, primary health care networks, in, uh, particularly in terms of single points of entry of care. And the Royal Commission into Mental Health and Victoria recommendations are set to bolster that with, with improved access and points of care. In the emergency department, we know that interventions within the emergency departments and interventions for pathways of care and programs of care as people step out of the emergency departments are incredibly important. And we follow with interest the research from around the country. And we particularly often follow the Queensland Centre for Mental Health Research. And Ed Heffernan and his group have done lots and lots of work in emergency department settings, trying to understand the risks and the flaws of people who present to emergency departments with mental health crises. And this was a, a, an interesting recent paper from 2019 outlining interventions for people presenting with mental health problems and identified the need for integrated, multifaceted and person-centred interventions. And we take those sorts of things very seriously at Eastern Health. On the ground, we've done some work recently with the Ken Miller Institute looking at, um, at a literature review of medium term interventions for people who attend our emergency departments with psychosocial crises. And this work with, um, with an honours student and her supervisor uh, looked uh, and examined several characteristics which predicted reduction of subsequent emergency department presentations and found that flexible person-centred care was really important, as well as goal setting and optional additional phone support services. At Eastern Health, we're also very lucky to now have a short stay assessment and planning unit called a PAPU. And these are, are, are units that provide up to 72 hours of care for people presenting in crisis. At Eastern Health, our PAPU is embedded within our Maroondah Emergency Department, providing the opportunity for people to avoid a full psychiatric admission, but still to have the benefit of a period of stabilisation and stronger linkages with follow-up, because we know that stabilisation and follow-up are important for, for people presenting, particularly with suicidal crisis. 
And now I'm going to turn my attention to one of the important developments that has occurred in Victoria, which are the HOPE teams, which provide a pathway of care out of our emergency departments. I would like to tell you that the HOPE teams are named after me, but that's not actually true. The HOPE teams are the hospital outreach post-suicide engagement programs. In Victoria, the suicide prevention framework of the, of the Victorian government set out to halve suicides over a 10-year period. And as part of this venture, the HOPE teams were established. The purpose of these teams was to address the risk of people who present with suicide attempts and suicidal ideation, who don't have a serious mental illness, but rather who present in psychosocial crisis, sometimes referred to as the missing middle. And Eastern Health was one of the first six sites to be selected to run those services. And at Eastern Health, Hope, the HOPE teams provide clinical and psychosocial support to people who've made a suicide attempt and more recently to those with suicidal ideation. And we provide up to 90 days of outreach care. We do so across the lifespan, that is the adult lifespan, 17 upward, but I understand that HOPE teams are being expanded to include people uh, of child and adolescent age groups. And engagement with HOPE aims to build resilience, autonomy, a meaningful life, and are underpinned by person-centred, family-inclusive approaches, and our, our collaborative recovery model, which you heard about earlier. The HOPE interventions include family support, clinical risk assessment and management, safety planning, substance use intervention, referral and warm handover. And warm handover is about not just saying, here's a card, bring these people up, but actually making sure that, um, that uh, the service at the other end is ready and willing to accept the person and that there is a clear overlap or transition of care and therapeutic letters. The results of the first six months of operation were published in Australasian Psychiatry last year. And I note my co-authors, Phoebe Williamson, Jose Segal, Lisa Gill, Michelle Orr, Brooke Trevora, Rebecca Garbett and Peter Herter in this important piece of work. And we demonstrated that the majority of people who came through our HOPE program were female, that the people who participated had a range of ages, and that most referrals came through the emergency department and many of the people who were with Cat, Papu and Cat had in fact come through our emergency departments as well. CL is our consultation liaison services that are in our medical wards. And the length of stay for people prior to coming into HOPE was 2.8 days. So these are not people who went to our um, inpatient wards. These are people who either came straight from our emergency departments or from Papu or our medical wards. 90% of people received assertive outreach. A substantial number of people also received family support, clinical risk assessment and management, substance use screening, referral and warm handover, and those therapeutic letters. The majority of people had a safety plan developed, strengths identified, and personal goals identified and guiding care. And a substantial number of people had identified reasons for living, interventions to make the environment safe, which is means restriction, and either collaborative recovery model or CRM worksheets. And the absolute majority of people had, um, uh, had contact between our teams and their GP, their family or other support practitioners. And the numbers of, fa of formal supports increased substantially through the HOPE period. The results. Firstly, in terms of well-being of people who went through our HOPE program, well-being was measured using the outcome rating scale score. And you can see here that the percentage of people who were um, uh, above the clinical cutoff started at only 6.7%, but by the end of engagement was at 80%, and that the baseline figures were low and at completion high, and these changes were statistically significant. We also have done some later work in, in what are called our consumer and carer feedback loops, which were peer worker designed and implemented and showed very high satisfaction with the HOPE services. And here's where the rubber hits the road. This is mental health crisis representations to our emergency departments for the two years following 
HOPE intervention. And this is for the first 37 people who went through our HOPE program. And you can see here, like in those studies from 1998, 1988 and 2016, that the, um, uh, that the relapse rate is present. Along the bottom axis, you can see um, months and uh, up to 24 months post hope and along the left is cumulative survival so that if nobody came to our emergency department the line would sit flat at 100 percent at the top and each time a person presents then there is a, um, a decrement down and almost 20 percent of people did indeed represent across the first six months of uh, uh, after engagement with hope and about a quarter of people represented within the first two year period. So you can see that the, that the action again is in that first six month period. But in many ways, the results of our research here spark more questions than are answered. We want to know, do the results hold up with larger data sets? And we now have those larger data sets. Hope has now been running since 2018. So we have almost four years of complete data. Is there a difference in outcome between those who complete HOPE and those who do not? Is there a difference in presentations between those who are offered HOPE and those who don't get into HOPE, that is, people who could be a control group? And are there effects of different components of care? We would like to answer many of those questions and we're currently doing both retrospective and prospective data collection and a lot of work has gone into identifying controls for our HOPE participants. We're also doing ongoing development of efficient data collection and feedback and we're aware of the effect of that feedback into our HOPE models and the dynamic changes that are occurring within our system that we have to take account of in our research. And so this is the work that we're doing and continue to do around the HOPE space. In conclusion, I hope that the data that I've presented today and an understanding of some of the ED challenges I've presented today has helped inform your understanding of the challenges and innovations at the ED coalface. I'd like to make some acknowledgements also. I'd firstly like to thank people with lived experience, their carers, supporters, uh, in terms of the people who uh, exist within the data presented today, but also the people with lived experience who contributed to our CRM development, our suicide prevention strategies, and who work on our teams in HOPE and ED and who work, on, importantly, on our service provision policy and governance committees within Eastern Health. I would also like to thank the HOPE and ED clinical teams and our current research team that you see here, El Jose, Asia, Margie, Michelle, Rebecca, Georgia, Phoebe and Anahita, a mix of clinicians, lived experience and research staff. In conclusion, we're extremely proud of the work we do. We collaborate, we innovate, we provide clinical care and integrated research, all on a local level on a shoestring budget. In conclusion, I would encourage you to remember your self-care and, uh, and, and to take care of yourselves now and in days to come and open the floor to questions. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Hope, for a very informative presentation. Um, yeah, so let's see if there's some questions from our audience. Um, we have one prepared here, which I will now read out. So there is a lot of pressure on school services to fill the support gap on an overloaded system. Yet 99% of the time when a student is referred to an emergency, is referred to emergency due to imminent risk, they show up to school the next day with no information other than what the student provides. No safety plan, no admission report, and not even a parent handover. Um, we know the student is not necessarily in the right place to provide accurate information or even understand the process they have gone through. So what can a school clinician do to maintain progress when all they get is the limited information provided by the student? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, or a good question and certainly a clinical 
conundrum and a difficult situation that, um, uh, that, that, this, that the school counsellor would find themselves in. And, and today I deliberately didn't um, present uh, uh, on, on uh, risk assessment and, and formulation and, um, and, and specific risk plans. Uh, I could spend an hour uh, talking to you about, about risk assessment and formulation, and I could spend another hour talking about um, uh, how to make um, uh, comprehensive plans, including safety plans and doing good, um, uh, good, good communication with others. And, and I guess the, the, the difficulties that this question outlines really reflects an, a number of, uh, of, of the challenges that I've, that, I've, that I've talked about today. And one of the most important challenges is the challenge of communication. That, uh, that difficulties with communication represent a very significant potential source of error within our emergency departments. And, and I think I mentioned at one point in time the importance of collateral histories, and we take that very seriously in emergency departments, but also the importance of communicating with others who are going to be involved in, um, uh, in, in uh, risk mitigation after people leave the emergency department. And that extends beyond families and carers in, into, other, into other systems include, and for children, that's, it's really important that that includes uh, 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 GPs and, um, and, and schools as part of the systems of, of the children to whom we provide care. The difficulty in doing that, um, I think, in emergency departments ref reflects a number of, of systematic factors, including um, I've outlined um, it, the issues that we have uh, in emergency departments about workflow and time pressure, just the chaos of emergency departments and things, and it's um, and the difficulty of operating in that in that very dynamic and fluid environment, but also issues around um, privacy. There's always a tension between the safety of people and their right to privacy, and uh, and, and shared information, and and this is um, uh, potentially uh, uh, more more problematic when we're when we're talking about about children and uh, adolescents. I, I speak from the perspective of providing care in a metropolitan um, uh, emergency department service, and we have the luxury of having a child and adolescent service, of having a child and adolescent access service, and having um, expertise around this. Whereas many people um, will present to emergency departments that don't have embedded mental health teams, that don't have access to child and adolescent uh, uh, expert teams, and um, uh, and and particularly. Um, uh, emergency departments in um, in rural areas uh, are potentially uh, going to have less access to services and expertise, and so the systems factors are really important around around those um, those areas. And certainly, where schools are identifying problems and refer and making the referrals, then I think that there is a, a, a burden of um, uh, of necessity to feed back to referrers and and to um, uh, uh, in, in order to address safety concerns. Uh, I, I can only sympathise with, um, uh, with the position and, um, and, uh, and, and certainly encourage uh, where there are children who have mental health issues, particularly mental health crisis issues, uh, um, open communication um, between the the the, um, the care providers within the child system. And unfortunately, that's as best as I can answer that question. Mm, thank you. Um, okay, there's another question in the in the Q and A panel um, from an anonymous attendee asking: Are patients only able to access hope once, and also only through an emergency department? Um, no and no. Um, in fact, the, the HOPE trials that were set up, the, there was originally six trial sites and, uh, and essentially the department said, go, go there hence and, um, and, and, and make a HOPE service. And each of those six sites was a little bit different in terms of their entry criteria and, and what was provided. And in fact, our HOPE sites have, have changed over time. And in particular, our HOPE sites now offer um, uh, lived experience peer work, peer workers, both carer and consumer peer workers, which we regard as being really important um, uh, developments in our in our HOPE programs. And so the HOPE programs have now expanded over many sites. And at Eastern Health, we actually have two HOPE teams now, the, our, our Central East and our Outer East teams. Mm. 
And, and so the capacity of hopes has widened very significantly. Nonetheless, there's some heterogeneity between teams in terms of, of, of what is offered by hope. So most teams will now provide care for people with who've made a suicide attempt or have suicidal ideation from emergency departments and from other, other, other um, uh, referral sources. And finally, um, the... Uh, uh, the, the teams are also expanding across uh, um, service uh, hours of delivery that the part of the Royal Commission findings were to expand our hours of delivery. So I hope teams are, 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 are delivering care in, in more flexible and creative ways and also, as I said, across a wider range, um, uh, age range as well. People can, um, at, at Eastern Health, people can enter into hope more than once. And, uh, and, and we re receive referrals from a variety of, um, of places. And there are um, statewide uh, plans to, to expand referral options um, so, so that it's not just within mental health services, uh, but we can accept referrals from, from, from wider conduits of care. Great. Um, okay, I don't think there's any other questions from our audience. Um... And I personally don't think I have any other questions. So if that's the case, I might move on to the closing bit. So um, thank you, Professor Hope, of course, for your very insightful and informative webinar and for answering these questions from our audience. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank each one of you for joining us for today's webinar on challenges and innovations, suicide prevention in emergency departments by Associate Professor Judy Hope. As part of your professional development, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to you very soon. I would also like to invite you all to join us for National Mental Health Month this October. National Mental Health Month is an awareness campaign initiative of the Mental Health Foundation Australia to advocate for and raise awareness of Australian mental health. Throughout this month, many events have been organized in each state of Australia, aiming to attract and unite Australians of all ages and backgrounds to raise awareness and promote better mental health for all. The theme for this year's National Mental Health Month is building resilience, communities and connections. I would also like to invite you all to join us this October in the fight against suicide. The Mental Health Foundation Australia launched the Mental Health Appeal on World Mental Health Day as part of our awareness campaign every October. Here is a quick video about the appeal. Over 400 young people lose their lives to suicide each year. This number is 400 too many. This year, the MHFA is launching the Mental Health Appeal on the 10th of October, raising funds to develop an evidence-based training program primarily aimed at promoting life and safety in young people. Join us this October in the fight against suicide. Your dollars and cents will help us prevent. Visit our website for more information on how you can support this cause. We're counting on you, Australia. And that's it for today's webinar. Um, thank you all again for attending um, and bye for now. Thank you.